Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. Well, it's so good to see you this morning, and um, I'm so delighted to be here with you in the Lord. Uh, we almost canceled services, and I was in the process of doing that, and I just didn't have a peace from the Lord to cancel the service. Amen. I mean, I, I, this, this, is, this is how your pastor operates. I don't care what people are saying. It's what the Lord says. And I, I understand, you know, and we want, you know, those who are most vulnerable, 80 years old and older, some say 60 and above or whatever, but you have a medical condition or whatever, yeah, you shouldn't be here. And this is a very serious virus and all of that. Um, but I, when I get God's word on something, everything else to me is background noise. I, and I heard Lord clearly say that he wanted us to continue to hold our services. Now, next week may be something else. But for this time, God has called us uh, to continue on. And, um, you know, we, we want to make sure we, <laughs> we're washing our hands and we're doing the Wakanda salute or whatever or, the, 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 you know, the shaka deal or whatever from Hawaii or, or whatever it is and just waving or whatever. We want to be careful. We don't, don't want to be foolish. Uh, but at the same time, we want to be obedient. And so the Lord has led us to uh, continue on with these services. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting uh, the times in which we live. There's so much panic out there. Uh, and, and I just don't, you know, I'm, I'm just still trying to understand the whole toilet paper deal. I, I'm just like, people are, you know, I'll fight for my country. I'll fight for my family. But I don't think I'm going to fight over no toilet paper. Amen. And, uh, but we live at a generation where I think they feel like if I don't get toilet paper, I'm going to die. And I think about great grandma and great grandpa, you know, <laughs> they didn't have toilet paper. If they did run out of toilet paper, there was always Sears and Roebuck. Come on. The catalog, right? Or you had newspaper or something. It didn't panic. There were no fights or wars breaking out over it. So uh, they, they're not from that generation. So I understand. People are, people are freaking out. And I don't blame them. You know, if you watch the news, if you, just, if you don't pray, if you don't have the word of God as a foundation for your life, you'll freak out. Amen. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting times. I thank the president for calling today a national day of prayer. Amen. Did you see that? We're going to do that in the beginning of this message. I thought I'd do it to the end, at the end, but let's do it at the beginning. Let's pray. Uh, and I, you know, you're getting your exercise this morning, but let's stand again. And we're going to pray for our nation, pray that uh, for an end to this coronavirus. Pray, as someone pointed out last service, really for our um, uh, health workers, our medical you know, doctors and people who are in the health medical industry, uh, they're under a lot of pressure. Schools are being closed, which I think was a smart thing and, and, and all of that. Uh, but um, we want to pray that God will remember our country because there's something else going on beyond that does, it doesn't meet the eye. If God is doing something with this. He has the whole world coming to its knees. I think, and I pray that he'd bring our nation back to that place where we began to rely upon God and realize we cannot save ourselves. Amen. So uh, let's, let's pray, because we know that judgment begins at the house of God. It doesn't begin at the White House. And if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and will turn from their wicked ways, because, you know, we're doing some wicked things, too. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And God said, I will hear from heaven. I will, I will heal their land. And so let us ask the Lord for, our, for help. We desperately need it. There's a lot of people who are panicking today. And look, if you're watching online today and you didn't come, you know, there's no condemnation. You're free to do that. And I know some people are really struggling. I understand that. Um, but uh, and especially if you're over 80 years old, as I saw one report, you know, stay home. And if you have some type of underlying uh, medical condition, stay home. I get it. You got a cough, stay home. You don't feel good, stay home. Uh, but if you're healthy and fit, you ought to be here. Amen. And uh, amen. So, but let's ask the Lord. We need his help today. Amen. Father in heaven, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus. And we ask, Father, as we come before your throne, as the, as the early church, Lord, as they prayed when they were threatened, as we are threatened by this coronavirus, Lord, they said, Lord, you are God. You're the creator of the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in it. 
So we come to you, dear God. We come to the one that is above our circumstances, not underneath our circumstances. And we ask, Father, for help for our nation. We ask that you would, Lord, there would be a, a spirit of revival in your church and there would be an awakening in, Amer in America, an awakening, Lord, around the world, Father, that mankind would come to their knees, Father, would come to the place on their knees, Lord, and cry out to you because, Lord, you're the only one who can save us. Lord, we ask you right now, save now. We ask, Father, for your help and for your strength. We pray for the comfort of the Holy Spirit, for you to remember those families, Lord, who have lost loved ones to this, this virus. We pray, Father, that you would be with them and that their eyes would turn upward and look toward you. Lord, because your voice is the only voice that speaks life. Your voice is the only voice that can be heard in the valley of the shadow of death. We pray, Father, also for the health workers, Lord, the doctors, and, and Lord, uh, the, those who are, are in the industry, Father, the, the, the medical industry, Father. We pray, Father, for their strength, Father. We pray for their protection in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray, Father, for, for uh, Lord, uh, those who, who are teachers, dear God, and, and, and all that they're dealing with, Father, and the students, and now that kids are at home. Everything, dear God, has is, is just been turned upside down. But, Father, we thank you that in Jesus we can be right side up. We thank you, Father, for the hope that we have in Christ, Lord, that you are God. But we pray that you will use this time, Lord, for your divine purpose and your divine glory. What Satan has meant for evil, Lord, turn it around for your good. Amen. To accomplish your good purpose and your good will. We pray, Father, for a vaccine to be discovered. The scientists are working feverishly, dear God, to, bring a, to discover a, a vaccine. Father, you already know what the vaccine is. We pray that you would give them wisdom. Wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. We pray, Father, that they would turn to you and say, we can't do this. And, Father, that you would reveal to them, Lord, what the vaccine is, Father. We pray for healing, Lord, physically in our nation, but we pray for spiritual healing in our nation. Bring America back to yourself. Save our nation, Lord, we pray, in the name of Jesus. We commit these things to you because we will trust in you. We shall not fear. We will not fear because you tell us to fear not that you are God. And so, Lord, we put our trust in you. Let us be motivated by faith in what your word declares, not by the fear that people are wrestling with even today out there in the world. Our trust and our hope is in you. We commit these things to you and ask this all in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen, amen and amen. God bless you. Amen. Thank you for praying. God bless you. You may be seated. We did put a uh, little slip, I think, in your uh, or a prayer list in your bulletin. Uh, you can take that home, be praying over those things this week, praying for our nation. Uh, I believe the Lord is definitely on the move in America and around the world. Amen. Well, speaking of the pandemic, I thought, well, what's a, a nice name for, a neat name for this message would be pandemic faith. Amen. Pandemic faith. We're in Acts chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 12 all the way to verse 42. And as many of you know, the coronavirus is now called a pandemic disease, a worldwide epidemic. And of course, scientists are working hard to find a vaccine to uh, bring about a cure to this virus. And what does it have to do with our text? Well, in our text, uh, the religious leaders in Jerusalem considered the gospel of Jesus Christ to be a pandemic among the people. Their futile attempt through threats to quarantine Jesus had failed. Amen. But what they really failed to realize is that Jesus is actually God's vaccine, his antidote for the incurable disease of sin that condemns mankind to an eternal hell. In my message today, I'm going to use terminology related to today, today's uh, coronavirus crisis, but from a spiritual perspective. Pandemic that is infectious, impactful faith is essential in overcoming any crisis. God wants, I believe, his people to have a faith that is pandemic. And so as we look at this virus, as with any virus, there are symptoms. In verses 12 to 16, we actually find five symptoms Evidence of a spiritual pandemic, an outbreak in the church. Verse 12, read along with me. Here in Acts chapter 5, it says, And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteem them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, 
multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on the beds and, and the couches, and that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem. The word got out. It began with spreading. It was a pandemic, amen? Bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Amen. Now, here we find what I call five symptoms, evidence of a spiritual pandemic outbreak within the church. The first one is signs and wonders. And the Lord said that signs and wonders would follow those who believe, but he doesn't want believers following the signs and wonders. Amen. We need to be following Jesus. But these signs will follow uh, those who believe, Jesus said. These signs and wonders are a manifestation of our faith in the power of God and not ourselves. The second uh, evidence or symptom we find here is fellowship. Verse 12 says they continued to fellowship at Solomon's porch, which is on the east side of the temple, on the Temple Mount. They continued to gather despite the threats, whether the threat was verbal, do not speak in the name of Jesus ever again, or viral, the coronavirus, amen. We are called to come together, whether the threat is verbal or viral. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much much uh, the more as you see the day approaching. What day approaching? The return, soon return of Jesus Christ. Amen. We need each other more now than we ever did. Amen. As we see the day approaching, as we see the plagues and the earthquakes and the things happening that the Bible says would happen, Jesus declared that they would happen, predicted they would happen. We need to come together for fellowship with one another. Now, I understand that, again, if you're you're, uh, 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 sick or whatever, or you're you're at uh, an age of being high risk or whatever with this uh, coronavirus, then yes, you should stay home. Amen. But if you are healthy, amen, and, uh, you know, nothing's wrong with you, I think you should be here. Amen. Uh, the, The Bible says, do not forsake the assembling of yourself. Now, if your faith is wavering and you're a little weak in your faith, and you say, Pastor Al, I, I like to be there, but I just don't feel like it, then stay home. That's fine. There's no condemnation for you in Christ Jesus. Amen? But uh, you need to pray and get over it and be here. Amen? God bless you. I'm just saying. Amen. I'm just saying the Bible says you don't forsake the assembly of yourselves. I don't know how else I can excuse that or set that aside. I think we need to, as much as we can, be with the people of God gathered together. They did at Solomon's porch as a symptom of the fact that they were infected by Jesus Christ. Amen. And the third uh, uh, symptom we find here is social integrity. Verse 13. The people knew that these disciples, that these followers of Jesus, these people who were infected with this pandemic spiritual virus, if you will, that of Christ, that they were no joke. They walked their talk. And when you think about it, if we panic in times of crises, then what good is our faith? If we're going, losing our minds and going as crazy as the world, they look at us and say, well, you're just like us. We ought to be the people that are, are allowing our light to shine in a time of crises. Amen. Let your light so shine before men that they may see our good works that our Father might be glorified, the Bible says. And so they had social integrity. These people knew these guys were the real deal. Here's the fourth symptom we find here. There was fruitfulness. Verse 14, God added to the church uh, a multitude of men and women. And he added to the church in context, we just studied last week, with this, after the subtraction of Ananias and Sapphira. Amen. God adds through subtraction. Less of you and more of him. Amen. God adds through subtraction. And sometimes people get an attitude. They want, I'm going to leave the church. You know, I'm, I'm leaving. You know, sometimes God adds through a t- subtraction. Amen. And, and I'm not being facetious, but sometimes I'm thinking when people say, well, we're just going to leave. I'm thinking, well, you know, God's the one who adds to the church. Not Pastor Al. I can't keep you here. Amen. But sometimes when I see people leave, I know God's going to do a great work. He adds and he multiplies through subtraction. 
People bemoan the fact that, you know, well, oh, the sporting uh, venues have been shut down. There's no b- more basketball, you know. And and my flight was canceled, you know. Uh, 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 oh, there's no more political rallies. Who would bemoan that? <laughs> I mean, who's, who's freaking out over that, you know what I'm saying? Oh, we don't get to hear any more spiritual, uh, uh, political speeches. Thank God. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> But a lot of people bemoan and say, oh, we can't, oh, I can't go there. I can't go there. But maybe, 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 just maybe, as God adds through subtraction, we don't have these distractions so we can focus on that which is important. Amen. Maybe your flight was canceled so you can spend more time with your family. Maybe, maybe, you know, you're that game ain't on right now so you can spend more time with your kids or so you can make that phone call to your mom or, or, or focus on relationships. Maybe God is using this, amen. I'm not, I'm not, one person dying from coronavirus is, is, is a tragedy. I'm not saying is it that that's a good thing, but God can use those things sometimes to gain our attention, to get us focused again on what is really important in our lives, amen. He adds to the quality of our lives many times through the subtraction of those things that are just a distraction. In God's economy, less can always equal, will always equal more. Here's the fifth symptom that I find here, and that is physical and spiritual healing. People were brought from all around, and they were all healed. They had, people were demon-possessed, and they were delivered from these demons. And we know that Jesus gave special anointings over his apostles. The apostles are doing these things for healing and for exercising demons. According to Matthew chapter 10, you see the reference on the screen in Mark chapter 16. But this was a sovereign work, a sovereign manifestation of God's power. And we need to keep that in mind. Because some people have, have entered into teaching heretical te- or, or, or promoting heretical teachings because it says here that all were healed. So therefore, everybody in the church ought to be healed. There should be healing for everybody. God heals all the time, always. That's not what the Bible teaches. You have to teach the whole counsel of God's word. And in an effort to, to support the fact that God heals all the time, always, they've entered into heretical teachings, heretical events, pushing people over and making them fall over sometimes, you know, so that they can, you know, they've been healed and having people running back and forth across the stage like they've been healed. Have some of them been healed? Probably so, yes. But they made a show out of it and they declare that everybody is going to be healed. And God heals all the time. Now, I'm telling you, in context, consider this. Because when we look at all of Scripture, I look at uh, uh, situations, examples like Timothy. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23, uh, Timothy had a a stomach malady. And Paul said, take a little wine for your stomach's sake. And wine's like it was a medicinal, had a medicinal effect upon his stomach. And then I think about, well, Peter was an apostle. How come Peter couldn't heal himself? Jesus told him in John 21 that you will, at the end of your life, you'll be blind. Now, why couldn't Peter just lay hands on himself and just heal himself? Amen? You know what I'm saying? Why, was it, why couldn't he have perfect health until the end of his life? And some have even taught, I mean, I've heard this teaching over the years, that if you really have faith, you'll never die. There was a Guy years ago was in town. He was the apostle somebody from Africa at a large church here in town. Some of you may remember. And he prophesied over that congregation, nobody in this congregation this year will die. And people died. You see, this kind of stuff wrecked a lot of people's lives. You see, you got to know the whole counsel of God's word. And then people say, oh, well, there's no sickness. You know, you know, that's a a bad and negative confession that you're sick. Hey, when people, believers get sick, in this world you will have tribulation. Somebody said it. I think his name was Jesus. Amen? But, but, in, but in Philippians chapter 2, I believe it's Philippians chapter, chapter 2, yeah, verses 25 to 27, a man by the name of, a disciple by the name of Epaphroditus. He was sick, the Bible says, unto death. And Paul said, by God's mercy, God's grace, God healed him. But he was sick. So just because the apostles were able to do this doesn't mean there wasn't any sickness, no stomach maladies, and no old age, you know, maladies in the church. So you have to look at the word in context, and, and, and here's the deal. Some people think, well, if God don't heal me and God don't do this, then God is not real. Listen, pandemic faith, that infectious faith, amen, 
Being infected with Jesus Christ is not about a fair weather faith. It is, a, it is not a conditional faith. It is a faith that Job spoke about in Scripture. Job chapter 13, Job says, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. That's pandemic faith. People will sit up and take notice when you have that kind of faith. When you have pandemic faith. That's the faith that we need today to overcome any crises that we're facing. But these five symptoms were evidence of a church subject to the authority of God, subject to the rule of God, subject to serving God rather than serving themselves or the world. You see, Satan wants us quarantined under his authority. He wants you quarantined under his authority, under your own limited ability to, to reason and rationale, to, to look at things or to reason and all of this. He wants you under his authority, quarantine, your faith, quarantine. You want to believe God, but oh, you, you can't break out from the quarantine of doubt and fear and unbelief. And in verses 17 to 42, the rest of our message here, we are going to focus on three spiritual vaccines, I call them, amen, sticking with the theme. Three spiritual vaccines by which we can escape the confines of satanic fear and unbelief, especially in times of trouble. And what are they, those three vaccines? They have to do with faith, doctrine, and joy, amen? And we're going to look at those beginning at verse 17, we have faith. All of them have to deal with faith, but faith in a common place. Now, verse 17, and of course, the background here is the symptoms of this being infected by Jesus have manifested in the church, and, and, and the word's getting out and spreading to other places. People are coming from other places. It's pandemic. And the Bible says, then the high priest rose up. The high priest who had threatened them to not speak in the name of Jesus again. They rose up and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. Here they are preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they were filled with indignation. And they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in, underline this, the common prison. <laughs> but at night, oh, God comes to you in the midnight hour, doesn't he? He comes to you in that time when you've reached the bottom. You think all hope is gone. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. Whoo! Go stand and speak to the people the words of this life, the life that is in Christ. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. Amen. Faith in a common place is like a vaccine against the quarantine of fear and doubt and unbelief in our lives. Notice, when faith becomes pandemic, I mean, the devil doesn't mind you having a quiet faith. You don't rock the boat. But when your faith becomes pandemic, amen, the devil grows indignant. The high priest and the, and the other elders there were indignant against the apostles. And the apostles were placed, the Bible says, they laid hands on them and threw them into the common prison. It was a common prison, a, a holding cell, a, a common prison for the blue-collar worker. It wasn't a white-collar prison, amen. Amen, where you had your little, you know, the, uh, you could play tennis and all that kind of stuff, right? No, it was a common prison for the down-and-outers, the people who were not well-connected. And they were placed in this common prison where hopelessness was common. Are some of you in prison this morning? You're in a place where it's hopeless, and it's like the devil said, oh, you've always been this way. You're always going to be that way. You're never going to change. Your mama was that way. Your daddy was that way. That's just the way it is. It's common to you. Amen? But, oh, what the devil never, he never banks on, he never tells you about, is that in a common place, we serve an uncommon God. Amen? That something uncommon happened in this common prison. God's power is not limited by your place. <laughs> 
God's power is not limited by your place, by our circumstances. In Genesis chapter 28, the story of Jacob. Jacob was, <laughs> came, the Bible says, in Genesis 28 to a certain place. It, it was so insignificant, it, it wasn't even given a name. A certain place. He was on a journey. He was actually fleeing from family trouble. His brother Esau wanted to kill him. He was, he was lonely. He was probably hungry. Laid his head down on a rock. He went to sleep. He slept and he dreamed. And in his dream, he saw a ladder reaching up into heaven. And on this ladder, angels ascending and descending. God is always working. He's always moving. I believe the angels are still ascending and descending to accomplish the purpose of God in the world. And the Bible says that God spoke to him in this dream. He woke up. And this is what he declared in Genesis 28. He says, surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. In your commonplace, where you are right now, in that place of doubt or fear or unbelief, God is there with you. Sometimes we just need to be awakened to that reality, and so was Jacob. He was awakened to that reality, and he was afraid and said, how awesome in this place. This is, God takes the commonplace and makes it awesome. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Listen, you are the house of God. Are you not the temple of God? Does not the Holy Spirit live within you? Then any place you're at is never common. Amen. We serve an uncommon God. Amen. Well, no matter where you are. And then the Bible goes on to say in Genesis 28 that Jacob, whose name means hill catcher, he, a trickster, that was his reputation. His name was changed in a commonplace from a hill catcher to Israel, a prince with God. Amen. God can transform your commonplace. Why? Because of his presence. And here we have in a common prison, the angel of the Lord showing up, appearing he opened the door and brought them out. When I think about that, he opened the door and he brought them out. It speaks of, to me, it speaks of salvation. How God has opened the door through faith in Jesus Christ, has sent his son to die for our sins. He opened the door. He brought us out. That's God's part. He's made a way of salvation. But then what did the angel say to them? Go stand. That's our part. That's faith. Faith without works is dead. Amen. God says, go stand. And sometimes God opens the way for us and we're standing and we say, well, Lord, can you, can you bring it here to me? No, go. Amen. Go stand. Faith without works is dead. Go stand. That's our part. God's part, made, he made the way. Our part, go stand. Amen. Go stand. And here's, here's the point. This faith in a common place is all about. That we actually inoculate ourselves when we choose to believe what we have heard. Imagine the apostles and the angel coming and saying, you know, the door the door's open, now go stand. Well, but the prisoner guard said we couldn't go. Would God have done anything spectacular? No. If they had to believe the word, and it, here's what happens with us many times, we'd rather believe the word that has incarcerated us than the word that liberates us. They chose to believe in the word that liberated them. Amen. They believed the word that they had heard. And God often, another lesson here is that God often calls us to stand when the world says sit down. The world doesn't understand it. They disapprove of it. But God often calls us to stand when the world says sit down. Sit down, be quiet, be compliant. And God says, no, go stand. What is the Lord doing? He's telling them to go against the authority of the priest who had told them not to speak in the name of Jesus anymore, and, and, and not only the authority of the priest, but the authority uh, of Rome itself, declaring Jesus to be their king rather than Caesar. When we believe God is with us, even in the commonplace, we can then glorify him in every place, wherever he calls us to stand. Amen. Someone who can't glorify God in those important places or whatever in their life, they're probably not believing God in the commonplace. If you can believe God in the commonplace, then you can glorify him every place he tells you to go and stand. Amen? 
So faith in the commonplace is, is like it, it inoculates us from the fear and the, and the unbelief that is in the world. And the second vaccine that I find here has to do with faith as well, but faith in Christ's doctrine. Faith and then doctrine is the second one. Verses 22 to 32. You read along with me. He says, but when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and, and reported, saying, to, uh, saying, indeed, we found the prison shut up securely and the guards standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. My God. Amen. My God. Oh, how did that happen? The doors were open. The guards didn't even notice anything had happened. Now, when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. So, so one came and told them, hey, I found them. Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Then the captain went with, with, uh, uh, with uh, the officers and brought them without violence. Well, they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. In other words, it's like, you know, could you apostles please come with us? They didn't snatch them up like they did before, right? Afraid of the people. Because the people were, were tuning in to what the apostles were teaching and all. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest said to them, asked them rather, saying, did we not strictly to command you not to teach in, the, in this name. I'm thinking, well, aren't you going to ask about the prison? <laughs> they don't want to know about that because they don't want to acknowledge that God is in it. And he goes on and says, and look, you have filled Jerusalem, here it is, with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. Amen. You know, here's a thought. The devil is always upset when you are not where he left you. He's always upset when you are not in that place of anger and bitterness. When you, he beat you up and put you down, destroyed your life, and said, locked you up and said, you stay here. That's why. And when he comes back, he wants to find you still locked up. But when you've been set free, amen, because of the doctrine of Jesus Christ, he's upset that you're not where he had left you. Don't be where the devil left you. Amen. They were upset. Oh, he's not. Did you want? Didn't we strictly tell? Yeah, you did. But the doctrine of Christ has set me free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. Praise his holy name. It's free indeed. But Peter, verse 29, and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. That's what I'm going to do. I pray you do the same. And when God has clearly spoken to me, what other people say really don't matter to me. That's, that's, you know, that's the way I live my life. I don't always get it right. I'm not perfect. I get a lot of things wrong. But my desire is to do his will. Because like Jesus said, my meat, my food, my bread, my sustenance, is to do my Father's will. I pray that it is yours as well. So we rather obey God than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him, God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior. That's important. To give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. We are his witnesses to, to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him, who put their faith in the doctrine of Jesus Christ. What is the doctrine of Jesus Christ? It is fully trusting in the name of Jesus for salvation. This is the gospel. This is the doctrine of Christ, the very doctrine that the enemies of Jesus Christ want 
to quarantine. Our government has tried to quarantine Jesus. The world has tried to quarantine Jesus, but they can't quarantine Jesus. They can't quarantine his name. They want to rid themselves of Christ. Why? Because like these religious leaders who are angry, indignant about the actions of the apostles, the name of Jesus indicts us as murderers. And the world doesn't want to be guilty. The world doesn't want to own up to the fact that their sins have crucified the Son of God. You're trying to put this man's blood on us. You know, it's been said that light is the best disinfectant, the best vaccine. Jesus called himself the light of the world. John chapter 3, he said, and this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Now, now Peter could have dimmed the light. He could have, he could have uh, uh, deactivated Christ's doctrine. It's just, uh, 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 in other words, he could have deactivated Christ, Christ's doctrine by, by dimming the light, by, by giving these religious leaders a more appeasing message of prosperity and acceptance. Oh, it's okay. There's many roads to God. You guys believe that way. We believe this way, but it's okay. But he didn't do that. He kept the light on, did he not? He did not change his message. Does he preach the same message that you killed Christ, you murdered Christ, but God raised him from the dead? Amen. Salvation comes to him. He alone is prince and savior. It's the same message he preached in Acts chapter 2. Verses 23 and 24, and in verse 36 of Acts chapter 2. It's the same message he preached in Acts chapter 3, verse 15. It's the same message he preached in Acts chapter 4, verse 10. Christ must be prince. He must be savior. He was preaching the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Some years ago, when we were in the other building, someone came to me. There was a well-known Christian leader coming to our church on that Sunday, and they thought they'd call ahead and say, hey, Pastor, I just want to know this person is coming. And I was wondering if you could kind of change some things up. <laughs> I believe in giving honor to where honor is due and respecting those who are in authority and all of that. But I'm not changing my message. Okay. Amen. Right. And if you change your message... Because if someone walks in the room or what have you, Paul says you're preaching another gospel. And anyone who preaches another gospel, Paul said, let them be accursed. Amen? Oh, they're coming. So you don't want to, they didn't say this, but I mean, sometimes, you know, some preachers, you know, that person's coming, they have a lot of money. I don't want to mention sin. I don't want to mention, you know, adultery because they're coming here with their girlfriend and they're still married. Really? You better preach the word. Amen? And Peter did not dim the lights. He didn't, he didn't try to uh, 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 give them a message that, uh, that, uh, that was appeasing to them in some kind of way. And he said this message that Jesus, this doctrine that Jesus is both prince and savior, he said that, that, that it's through him only that we have forgiveness and that this message, this doctrine is validated by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The Holy Spirit has been given to us. Romans chapter 8 says the Holy Spirit lives in us and, he, and cries out from within us that we are children of God by saying, Abba, Daddy, Father. The Spirit of God has been given to everyone who's been born again. And the Spirit cries out from us, Abba, Father. It's essential that Jesus be both Prince and Savior. For this is his doctrine. Because if he's only Prince, then he could probably be nothing more than a social icon. He's a great moral leader, but he's not savior. He's just a prince, and a lot of people look at Jesus as a prince. Oh, he was a wonderful prophet. Oh, he did some wonderful things. Oh, those teachings are wonderful. They're good 
business practices, you know, principles that apply to my business. But he's just prince. But is he savior? Because if he's just prince, there's no need for me to confess my sins. There's no need for me to be accountable to God. If he's just savior, he's just savior, then I'm walking around, I'm, I'm content in the fact that I have my fire assurance. But I'm not walking in life and life more abundantly. Because he's just Savior. He's not Prince. And Prince means Lord. He's not the Lord of my life. Therefore, I I, I feel good about the fact that, oh, I come to church and and, and I'm on my way to to heaven, so I think. But I don't have to revere him as the ruler, the undisputed authority in my life, my Lord. Don't have to revere him. So he must be both. He must be Prince and he must be Savior. This is the doctrine of or, the, uh, or Christ, what Christ's doctrine, I should say, this is what it demands. It demands that he be both in our lives. We have truly, if rather, I should say, we, if we truly have been born again, he must be prince, he must be Lord, he must be Savior. Jesus said it this way, Luke 6, 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, Prince, Prince, and not do the things which I say? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? We must yield our lives to the doctrine of Jesus Christ. It was the doctrine, their faith in Christ, that set them free from that prison. And the doctrine of Christ will inoculate us against the quarantine of fear and unbelief, especially in troubled times. Hold fast to the hope that you have in Jesus. Here's the last vaccine that we find here. It is the vaccine of faith, again, an act of faith, but faith to rejoice in suffering. Faith to rejoice in suffering. Peter tells us that as believers we have been called to suffer for Jesus' sake. Don't hear a lot of preaching on that today, but that's what the Bible teaches. Faith to rejoice in suffering. Look at verse 33. When they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. They weren't just a little mad at them. They wanted them gone. And then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in respect by all the people, and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. And he said to them, men of Israel, Take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Thutis rose up claiming to be someone, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. Now, some scholars I've read of biblical commentaries uh, say that the scholars aren't sure who this studious was. Uh, there's one uh, uh, opinion that it was just a person uh, that it lived. Uh, 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 it was actually sometime after the events that we're reading about here. Uh, so maybe it wasn't that studious, but it was somebody they believe, maybe one of the revolutionaries that rose up uh, toward the end of Herod the Great's uh, reign. There were Muslim revolutionaries that rose up at the time. And so it may have been, he may have been one of those revolutionaries that was killed and every, all of his followers were scattered. And he said in verse 37, uh, and after this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away many, many people after him. He also perished and all who obeyed him were dispersed. Judas of Galilee, uh, uh, Josephus, the Jewish historian, actually speaks about Judas of Galilee and um, uh, he was actually called Judas of, it's uh, pronounced the Golanite. Judas is the Golanite. He's gullible, I guess. Anyway, but he, was, uh, but he rose up during the um, census, uh, the, the edict that was uh, issued by Quirinius. Remember that Quirinius uh, uh, asked for a census to be taken. That's why Joseph and Mary returned to Bethlehem. Remember that. And so during this time of taxing the people, you know, uh, this Judas of Galilee rose up and had a bunch of followers, and they, of course, killed him, and then his followers uh, were dispersed. And he goes on here to say uh, that they were dispersed. And he says, now, 
He says, uh, this person perished, and now I say uh, to you, keep away from these men, verse 38, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, <laughs> you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. When you think about it, Gamaliel is, is really... Uh, really validating who Jesus Christ is. There's historical validation of the fact that Jesus Christ is who he said he was. And this goes to the historicity of Jesus too as well, because people say Jesus didn't even exist. Well, uh, uh, historians would mention Jesus. He was a real person. It wasn't some made-up thing that he really did exist. But look at the historicity of Christ and the validation, the authenticity that is given to Jesus Christ. For Gamaliel said, listen, if this guy is just, some, is this just a fluke, it's just going to fade away. But here's the reality. The very temple that they relied upon there in Jerusalem has faded away. It was destroyed in 70 A.D. And the very Roman government, amen, that crucified Jesus Christ, that government is now in ruins. But the kingdom of God, that little baby that was born in Bethlehem, amen, his kingdom is pandemic and spreading throughout the entire world, amen. So all those who try to destroy him are God and Christ. His kingdom continues to thrive. It is pandemic, amen. And so, you know, it's very good counsel he's given them here. But it just proves to the authenticity of who Jesus Christ is because his kingdom continues to go on while theirs have ceased. And the Bible says in verse 40, and they agreed with him. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, listen, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. They were rejoicing that they just, they just got a beat down. I mean, how, how many of us, you know, can rejoice when we have a bad day? These guys have gotten beaten up for Jesus' sake, and they rejoice that they were counted worthy. And how many times have we said, God, it's not fair. I'm worthy of something good happening and something bad. It's not fair. <laughs> and here they are saying they did everything right. They were obeying God. And then they got beat up for it. And they said we were counted worthy to be brought to shame for his name. Wow. We are miles from that today in the church. I remember years ago as a young aspiring pastor and didn't know where I was, what I was doing, but I knew God had called me, and we we're a part of Calvary Chapel of Colorado Springs, which is really the roots of this fellowship, and it used to be located down on Vermaho and Nevada Avenue. The building's still there, a little red, that red brick building. It used to be Calvary Chapel of Colorado Springs. We were overflowing. People were coming. Young people were coming, getting saved. It was, it was a wonderful time. One of the things we had to do as intern pastors was to show up early Sunday morning, uh, to pick up the beer bottles and, cig and clean up all the cigarette butts from around the, the church. One, because the church people were drinking. It was because Nevada Avenue used to be a drag strip many years ago in the 80s. Some of y'all remember that, amen? Some of y'all were down there, I know, but that's all right. <laughs> and they used to race cars up and down Nevada Avenue. It's nice now, but it wasn't back then. And you have young people hanging out and stuff and fights breaking out and stuff, and they would be doing that right in front of the church. We try to witness to them sometimes and stuff. And, but we had to get there early and pick up the beer bottles and cigarette butts and all that. And uh, I remember going out, and we had to get there about 5 in the morning. So I, but I remember thinking, man, that I was counted worthy by the Lord to pick up beer bottles and cigarette butts for Jesus Christ. I counted it worthy to clean a toilet for the Lord. I counted it worthy that God would allow me to just show up and stand over here and, and just be here to serve him, to be his slave. I, I was just so blown away that God would see fit that some, somebody, somebody like me would be counted worthy to be called into a service. Church, we have gotten away from that. And here, now I'm, I didn't get a beat down, amen, like the apostles here, 
But that, that attitude of humility and servitude, realizing that I'm not, you know, I, that I'm not the leader of Christ, I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. But now we got the church full of people who believe they actually deserve stuff. You know, God owes me. You know, oh, God didn't do that. Oh, I'm out of here. Really. Here they are rejoicing over the fact that they were beat down, brought to shame. We want everybody to like us. We want everybody to, to approve of us. They were brought to shame for the fact that they were obeying the word of God. And they rejoiced in it. They believed, as Paul said in Romans chapter 8, he said, for I consider, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I consider, the Greek word for I consider or reckon, I reckon is logizomai. It means to take inventory. Could it be that my, my lack of joy, our lack of joy today, is due to the fact that we are counting the wrong inventory? Could it be that we're looking at the inventory of the world, the riches of the world, what the world can offer us, what I can do for myself, but I'm not looking at the inventory, the promises of God's word. And therefore, I have no joy. I can't rejoice in the midst of my situation because I'm taking the wrong inventory. Are you focused on the promises of God? Are you taking the right inventory? Amen. The Bible says rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say what? Rejoice. Rejoice where? In the Lord. In the Lord. And who he is. And his promises. Because so many Christians are walking around with scowls on their face. Don't have no joy. Because they're rejoicing in themselves and not in the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen? Nehemiah 8.10 tells us, His joy, delight thyself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. Because when you delight in the Lord, your heart gets right. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Delight in the Lord. We can break free, therefore, from the quarantine of fear and unbelief. With the vaccine of faith, doctrine, and joy. In conclusion, pandemic faith is really kingdom faith. Faith living according to the principles of God's word and not the word of this world. I would exhort you, let us not allow fear of the coronavirus to quarantine our faith in Christ. My wife and I, when people are talking about the you know, quarantine, and you're right, and again, I'll say it, if you're not here because you don't feel like it's safe or for health reasons, fine, you are fine. Don't walk out of here going, Pastor, I was condemning people for not being there. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't say that. That's a lie from the devil. But what I am saying is don't let that fear quarantine your faith. Continue to believe God, to pray. God will guide you. He'll lead you. Amen? But <laughs> my wife and I were at, we tried to go to the, you know, the view house is at New restaurant can't get in the place now I'm thinking that they want the church and I and I want to comply I want to obey the authorities and all this kind of stuff but as I looked at what the, the governor said the other day I I thought he said he's and I quote he said uh, he said basically most gatherings you know be limited to 250 people and this kind of thing and he was he was speaking to the churches one of the churches to limit it I get it but I thought, we got to make sure that we don't touch each other, that we practice a six-feet rule. Well, well. Oh, man, I wasn't going to go here, but I'm going. <laughs> but I went, to the, I went to the view house, and I think schools and should be shut down, all that. I get that. But people were packed in the view house. I couldn't even, we couldn't even get a, a table in there. I mean, it was so full. Of, it, it seats 800 people, I was told. People outside, upstairs on the second level, you know, it's kind of a young person scene. It was kind of, they're getting on, they're having fun. It was awesome, you know. 
We couldn't get a table. We had to go someplace else. And then that restaurant was full. I think, well, I don't see anybody at the view house practicing the six feet rule. <laughs> and I thought, now, if they can have enough faith to gather for the flesh, how much more faith should we have to gather in the spirit? <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> and besides, we're serving the best food anyway. Amen. Amen. That which feeds your soul, the word of God. Amen. The bread of life is on the menu. Jesus is the main course. Amen. And so we can wash our hands and we should wash our hands and we should practice good hygiene and do all these things. Don't be foolish. But we can wash our hands all day long, but you can't wash your soul. Only Jesus can cleanse the heart. And what America needs today is a clean heart. We need a savior. We need a prince. We need to return to the Lord. Only he can remove our guilty stain, the stain of sin. In John 5, 24 and 25, Jesus said it himself, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death to life. A lot of people trying not to die, but who's trying to live? There's everlasting life through faith in Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for your word.